Well, good morning once again, everybody. It is so good to see everyone. You know, that one thing, if you could just do one thing consistently in our lives, everything changes. Hi, my name is Eric Bucci, and I'm the lead pastor here at Cornerstone Church. Thank you so much for braving the elements this morning. Guys, give yourself a hand, everyone watching online. Come on. You do better than that. Come on, everybody. Well, uh, the, the weather's not quite as frightful as I said it was going to be, but it's good to see everyone this morning. Oops, are we good? Thank you so much. Appreciate it. And so we are um, having a one-of today. We're going to continue with our series on the Beatitudes next week once again. But today we're going to be talking about this and what we can do in our lives. What's that one thing? Uh, okay, everybody. My remote control disappeared. Can you hang on one second? We're having one of those mornings. Uh, what happened to my remote control? <laughs> okay. Got it? All right, there it is. I got it. All right, everybody. Come on. This is great, right? This is not heaven yet. Just want to let everyone know that. So things go, things go, things will happen. There we go. It's my remote control. And there we go. The miracle habit. And so today we want to talk about a habits that will literally change your life. And so many times you and I can make New Year's resolutions and we can try to put on a new leaf, but the studies have shown that 92% of people that make New Year's resolutions, 92% of them are broken by Valentine's Day. Aren't you encouraged by that, everybody? Yeah. Uh, a lot of times we get frustrated with New, New Year's resolutions. And sometimes you're like, you know what, I'm tired of trying. I keep on trying to do the right thing. I keep trying to make a change. And I keep on doing the same thing over and over again again. I said I wouldn't do this again. I'm doing it again. I said I wouldn't eat as much. I'm eating again. I said our relationship would be different. And it's the same. I said I wouldn't procrastinate, but I think I'll start tomorrow. But anyhow, it's always like another thing like that and gets so frustrating. And, and so many times you and I can get to the point where we're like, well, what's the sense anymore? But I, I, I have news for you. That if we do this, the miracle habit, this, the miracle habit will change everything. You know, uh, what happens, the miracle habit creates a habitat of miracles in your life. I know on Christmas we talked about miracles, right? We talked about miracles for our Christmas Eve service. And the miracle is God working in our life, interrupting the normal flow of things and bringing his kingdom in it. And so if you and I will continue to understand that miracle habit, what's the miracle habit? The miracle habit is this. I know it sounds ridiculously simple, but it's so profound. Is that Jesus is first in everything that we do. That he is the utmost of everything we do. Everything we do, he is first in. Seeking first the kingdom of God. That his ways are higher than anything else, and we seek after him first. That, my friend, is the miracle habit I want to encourage you with. The one thing that changes everything is Jesus. You see, Jesus, think about it, everybody. Human, humanity had such a difficult time. And Christ came and took all of our sins upon himself took all of our diseases, and what did he do? He paved a way for us. He paved a way of kingdom living, and he wants us to be in that living, all of us. And so rather than trying to do all these New Year's resolutions, nothing wrong with trying to have new habits. But without that first thing, nothing else really matters. It reminds me of a story I heard of a couple that went on a three-month uh, European journey and a river cruise and all that, and then they get to the airport, three months, they have all their bags packed, they get to the front counter, and uh, the husband keeps on saying to the wife, she says, we have all the bags? I left one. I, I wish I brought the piano. She's like, what are you talking about? And, she, and the lady goes, do you have all your bags? Yeah, I do. And he goes, I wish I brought the piano. She says, what are you talking about? Getting irritated. What do you mean, I wish I brought the piano? I left the tickets and passports in the piano. <laughs> well, so many times you and I can be the same way. We can have everything put together. We have all the baggage packed. We have everything, all the paraphernalia ready to go. But we forget the most important thing, the ticket to life. And that is Jesus Christ. And if he's not first, what really matters anyhow? So the one thing that changes everything. And so as I was praying about 2022 and I went away to fast and pray a few days and, you know, sat there with a pad and thinking, asking God and I had a great time with the Lord, but I got no no big revelation for 2022. I often pray and I ask God for scripture verses for the following year. God, what do you want to do in 2022? And a couple of weeks ago, before Christmas, I'm in the shower, and I feel like the Lord just told me, he says, stretching two in 22. I know it sounds like something kind of nice and something you can remember, but I believe God is stretching two in 22, the higher calling of Jesus Christ. 
God wants us to stretch forward. I believe that 2022 is going to be a great year of preparation. The last two years almost now, we've been under everything that we normally used to happen has been interrupted, right? Many of us are trying to go back to the way it used to be. I wish we could go back to the way church used to be. I wish we could go back to the way school used to be. And we're trying to go back, but the truth of the matter is it's never going to go back. In fact, if you try to go back, you're going to be greatly disappointed. And let me give you an example. A, a number of years ago, uh, my great-great-grandmother, my great-grandmother actually, was born in 1870. Can you believe that? Yeah. I'm that young. Anyhow, so she immigrated from uh, Germany to the United States with her husband, my great-grandfather. And they set up in New Jersey, started a brand new business in the early 1900s. Things were going phenomenal. But she was homesick. She's like, man, I miss Germany. I miss the mother country. This is before World War, World War I. And, uh, and so, uh, like a good husband, he decided that a happy life is a happy wife. An unhappy wife is a knife. I didn't say you did. So she, she said, okay, you know what? I'm going to do the right. He, so he went home, and he packed up their bags and went back to Germany. When we went back to Germany, my grandmother's like, everything's changed. Nothing is the way it used to be. She tried to go back. In fact, my wife Sandra did the same thing. She came to the United States of America because her family came here. My mother-in-law was sitting in the front. Hey, Mama. Good to see you. Happy New Year again. And, and, and so she came, and she's like, you know, I miss Columbia. I want to go back to my friends. I want to go back to the way the church used to be. I want to go back. And she went back, and what happened, honey? You didn't like it because you knew you had to meet me, so you had to come back. <laughs> Which, by the way, did happen, and now we have three beautiful children, okay? But anyhow, but she tried to go back, and she couldn't go back because everything changes, everybody. God is not calling us to go back to the way that things used to be. God wants us to stretch forward. Now, when you've been sitting dormant for a period of time, your muscles get kind of tense, and atrophy can come in if you're not careful, if you're not using something all right. But in order to move forward, it's important before you go to a new level of exercise, or if you're going to be a, a football player, or a basketball player, or a soccer player, before you go on the, on the field, before you go to lift weights, as you can tell, I do a lot of that. And uh, you want to stretch out first to prepare your muscles for what's going to happen. If not, you can pull your muscle a lot easier or pull your muscles. And so we want to stretch. And so I believe God is calling us to stretch forward in 2022. I believe this is a great year of preparation. I believe God has showed us a number of things over the last couple of years. And one of the things that the Lord has really impressed upon me is we want to emphasize more than ever discipleship. And, and, and the amazing thing is God's not looking for a program or a system. He's looking for a people that are saying, I want to grow Christ closer in Christ. And so we're, we're asking God, God, we don't have it all together, but God, what can we do to see people become more like Jesus Christ? How do we really do what you've called us to do? I'm teaching them to observe everything I command you. God wants us to grow together. God is calling us to have more of an impact in our community. And so we're looking at how we can expand and how we can have more of an impact in our community in the coming years. So I really believe that God also wants to do something tremendous in our next generation. God wants to raise up even more worshipers. He wants to raise up even more young people and families. He wants to do more and more. But in order to do that, we have to stretch. We have to grow. We have to get ready. And I believe that 2022 is stretching to the higher calling that Christ has for us. So this is really the theme I think God has for us. And the scripture verse for that is this. In Philippians 3.12, the Apostle Paul says this. I don't mean to say that I have already achieved these things. The Apostle Paul, who wrote a third of the New Testament, a very educated man, an incredible man, says, I have not achieved it yet. I did not achieve it yet, the things that I have already reached, perfection. But I press on to possess that perfection for which Christ Jesus possessed for me. He didn't say, I'm going to try to live the... Um, Palestinian dream or the Jewish dream. No, I'm going to go forward to what Christ has done for me. Christ has broken the ice for us. Christ is our way. He is our truth. He is our life. And everyone, we can do that, but Christ has broken it for us. So we want to go after what Christ has for us, what Jesus has for us. He says that. I press on to possess that perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it. And here's the Apostle Paul saying that. But I focus on this, what? 
One thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead, I press to reach or I stretch. I stretch to the end of the race to receive the heavenly prize for which God through Christ is calling us. He's going for the higher prize, my friends. Are we willing to stretch? Are we willing to leave behind the elementary things? Are we willing to say, God, I want everything you have for me in 2022? And rather than trying to change everything, how about we just do one thing? We just do one thing. If we do that one thing right, you see, the major thing, of course, is this. Giving your life to Christ Jesus. That's number one. And, of course, the great commandment uh, is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength. That's the key, obviously. The second great commandment is to love your neighbor as yourself. But besides those obvious ones that are extremely important that actually encompass the fruitfulness that you and I can have, if we do those two things, our life will be amazing. Isn't it amazing how simple it is? God doesn't make it complicated. He makes it almost to the point where it's almost insulting. It's so simple. But it's so profound. It's so deep. I mean, you can spend the rest of eternity discovering the love of God. I mean, look at the universe out there. And so you can never get bored going into the kingdom of God. If you're bored, it's not God's fault. Okay? So I press to reach the end. Well, how do we do that, everybody? Well, this is how we do it. Jesus tells us how to do it. He says the following. But seek first. And by, before this comes... Before this verse comes, he's saying, people are wearing. Don't worry about what you're going to wear. Don't worry about 2022. What's going to happen with the economy? What's going to happen with the Omni, uh, um, Dodge Omni virus? Uh, what's going to happen with this? What's going to happen with our country? Uh, what's going to happen with my family? And we, we think about all these things. We think of what's happened. We get kind of nervous. We get kind of worried. He says, don't worry about that. This is what you ought to do, Jesus says. I'm going to give you an antidote for what you need to do. But seek first. And, and, the, and the word seek there, everybody is trying to find your keys because you're going to be going to a job interview and you can't find your keys. How are you going to look for your keys for your house before you blame the whole family first? You're going to seek diligently, right? That's what we're talking about. Seek what? First. First. Order matters. The kingdom. That means God's ways of doing things. Not your kingdom, not the kingdom of the United States of America, not the kingdom of the Republican or Democratic Party, not the kingdom of a certain type of church. No, the kingdom of God is bigger and greater than any government. He's bigger than any social movement. And I'm a little concerned sometimes that we get so wrapped up in the kingdom of this country, in the kingdom of what's going on in our economy, that we forget that we are living in an economy that transcends all history. So seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, which simply means the right things of God. That's what righteousness is. You know, you learn from Goldilocks. Don't you remember Goldilocks, what she said? Too hot, too cold. That's just right, righteousness. She found the righteous porridge. She found the righteous rocking chair for all you little children out there. And she found the righteous bed, right? Everything was right. And so God, righteousness simply means the right thing, right? We all want that, right? We want all around right relationships. We want to have happiness, all these wonderful things. And the truth is it all comes from God, and that's where it comes from. So disorder versus order. Ever hear someone say, man, that person has a disorder, right? Or how about something that says out of order? You need to use something, and it's out of order. How frustrating is that? What does it mean it's out of order? It has disorder. It's not in the proper order. And since it's not in the proper order, it's not functioning properly. God has an order. And you take it out of order, you're going to have disorder in your life. And so how do we do it? But seek, not second, not third, not fourth, seek first. God has to be first. God is the starting quarterback. He's not second string. He's not the second violinist in the orchestra. He's either first or he's last. Now, make no mistake. I, I've done it, and I, I say, God, I want to live for you. I want to put you first, and I mean it with all my heart, but like most of you, or me, I'll speak for myself, I don't always do it. I get caught up in my own ways. I think about my own problems, but my heart intent is to do the right thing. So we have to make a decision, and, and sometimes we're at different percentages of Christ being first. But our aim is that, because it works. But seek 
first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. So that's what God wants. He wants us to have first. Seek first, not second, not third, everybody. And so order matters. And the reason why we're such in disorder is we don't seek God first in our relationships often. We don't seek God first in our finances. We don't seek God first in our job location or even our daily schedule. It seems like if I can squeeze him in, I'll squeeze him in. This is what we tend to do. So this is what Jesus had to say about this, okay? Jesus says this, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. Jesus is the prototype of what you and I are called to be, except for the fact that you and I are not perfect. Okay, look at your neighbor and say, you're not perfect. And tell your neighbor, neither are you. Now that I woke you up. Okay. So Jesus said to them, truly, truly. In other words, listen up, guys. I say to you, the son can do what? You know what nothing means? Not a thing. You learned something new today, okay? So the son can do nothing on his own. Own. This is Jesus, the perfect Son of God. This is Jesus who is God incarnate, 100% man, 100% flesh. And Jesus, 100% man, 100% God, he can do nothing on his own. Now, if Jesus being perfect could do nothing on his own, why do we think somehow, some way, we can do it on our own? I know it's a nice song. All by myself. I don't want to be. You don't have to be all by yourself. In fact, Jesus says, you'll never be by yourself. And if you feel by yourself and you're in Christ, it's a lie. Because Jesus was forsaken, so you never have to be forsaken. So maybe you feel by yourself today. For someone today. Maybe you feel like no one cares, no one knows what you're going through. The truth of the matter is this. Jesus was by himself, so you never have to be. And so if you ever feel that way, it's a lie. It's not true if you're giving your life to Christ. So... I can, so Jesus said to them, truly, I, truly, I say to you, the son can do nothing on his own accord, but only what he saw, is that what it says? Sees, which means continuous action. Jesus only does what he sees the father doing, which, which means a constant, and actually the apostle Paul says in Thessalonians, Pray without ceasing, which sounds like an impossibility. How am I supposed to pray without ceasing? Am I going to sit in my room all day long and have my hands folded, my eyes closed? No. Communication with God. Constant communication with God. Knowing that God is with you. Like the air that you breathe. You know he's around you. Jesus only did what he saw the Father doing. Everyone Jesus prayed for was healed. But he didn't pray for everybody. Everything Jesus did was directed completely by the Father. He says, I can do nothing on my own, of his own, but only what I seize the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, the Son does likewise. So his steps are ordered. Does that mean we're supposed to sit at the edge of our bed? Okay, Lord, blue jeans or sweatpants today. God, tell me, speak. No, I'm not talking about that. His, his written word is right there. Most of the word's right there, right? But this is reliance on God. The book of James talks about making plans for the future. He says, you go ahead and make plans, but say, if the Lord wills. So we make plans. And this is what I often tell people. If you don't know what God's calling you to do now, what's the last thing he told you to do? Keep on doing it until he tells you something else. Keep on going the right direction. And be willing to say, yes, Lord. We make plans for 2022, right? No one saw this pandemic coming. I didn't hear one prophetic word about this pandemic. God just totally just threw us all off our, our game plan. We, we, didn't, we weren't ready for it, were we? But the good news is God has something new for us. And so we have to be willing to say, okay, God, what do you have for me here? God, what's the next step? God, what do you want me to do? And you have to be willing to hold on tightly to God and loosely to your plans. Because if you hold tight onto what you think God's called you to do and it's not his will, like I, I've done this, am I the only person that's ever done that? Man, that's painful. Trying to, God, I know this is your will, God. I'm not going to let go. Maybe, no, I don't want to hear it. And I kept on holding on to something that wasn't his will. You know how painful that was? I wasted so much time. 
But instead, we need to hold on to Christ, hold on to God. God, I'm not letting you go. Your kingdom, the way forgiving people, doing the right thing, I'm going to hold on to you. And everything else, I don't know what's going to happen, but God, I'm holding on to you. You are that one thing that matters in Jesus' name. And that's what we have to do. So whatever the Father does, the Son does likewise. My friends, this is a continuous present action. This is real-time communication. God is not a story we read and try to do all the good stuff. It's not a religion that we read. It's not like an IKEA instructions where you get this horrible thing and you try to put this thing together by yourself. Am I the only one that has trouble with IKEA? Okay. And they're really heavy, by the way. No, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about a relationship that's ongoing and real. It's in real time. And so... Well, God hasn't told me what to do. Listen, how about we start what we know he's told us to do? He's told us to spend time with him. He's told us to trust him, right? And so we can see this. And as we trust God with the small, he can give us the tall. If, you, if God can trust you with the small, he can give you the tall. That's what happens. That's what Jesus says. So first of all, Jesus says it's about himself. I do nothing of my own accord. Then he tells his disciples in another passage of Scripture later on in John, he says this, I am the vine. You are the branches. He's the vine. The branches come off the, the vine, and that's where the great clusters are. But without the vine, the great clusters die. They're dried up. He says, I am the vine. You are the branches. Whoever abides, not, not whoever comes to church once a week, whoever just listens to Caleb and has Chick-fil-A sandwiches. That's not what we're talking about. I had to bring it up for the new year. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides stays in me, and I in him... He is the one that bears much fruit. From apart from me, you can do nothing. Now, it may look like something to everyone else, but it means nothing to God. In fact, it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 that you can live your life doing all these things, and it will burn on the fire. You take nothing with you. See, what you do for God is both here and now and forevermore. And so it's not about pleasing your neighbor and your friends. And by the way, what a horrible place to live trying to please your neighbors and friends, trying to please people you don't even care about on Instagram and Facebook and Twitter. I mean, and trying to please yourself and trying to match up to someone else. Forget all that. God, I want to please you. You have a path for me. No one else has. And that's what he wants for us. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he's or she's the one that bears much fruit. From apart from me, you can do nothing. So really it's about being abiding. Staying in God. Well, how on earth do we do that? He goes back and says, Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient is its own day. One of the things we learn in those 12-step programs, which are found in a lot of biblical programs, is you take one day at a time. An alcoholic or a person that's trying to get free of drugs to say, today I was sober. I can't, I can't control what happened in the past. I cannot control what's going to happen tomorrow. But I have today. My friends, God is giving us enough. He says, don't worry about tomorrow, he says. Today is enough. And I like what I read recently where it's like, oh, tell you what, I'm not going to worry today. I'm going to take care of today. I'll, I'll, I'll worry tomorrow. And then tomorrow comes, and you push off worry to the following day because you're in the middle of today. So why don't we just keep on pushing away worry to the following day, and when we get to that day, push it to the following day, and you'll never worry because God's in the middle of it all. Why worry, right? Jesus says you can't grow one inch more by worrying. Why bother? It's one of those fruitless things. I'm not saying we don't care. Taking, being sober-minded and taking account of what's happening is one thing. But worrying is basically meditation on a negative direction. Worry is meditation in a negative, godless direction. I don't want to go that way, do you? Absolutely not. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own thing. Sufficient is the day's trouble. As Tony Evans, one of my favorite pastors, says, there are two days you are not to spend a lot of time on. Yesterday and tomorrow. Yesterday you can't go back to, and tomorrow you, can't, you haven't gotten to yet. And he's so right when he says that. He's so right, and he says, in fact, to give a little advertisement, Tony Evans is going to be the speaker for a week at Camp of the Woods the first week, the last week in June. So I might be going if you guys want to go with me. It's a great week. Anyhow, that's a little, little advertisement that I get nothing from. Let's move forward. Summer's coming, everybody. Can I hear an amen? Yeah. Okay. 
And here's Jesus again. Therefore, I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more about than clothing and all these things? And he's saying that the Gentiles, the non-believers are dominated by these things. Everything is controlled about trying to have all these things, trying to keep up with everyone. I mean, how exhausting is it, everybody, trying to keep up with your neighbor, trying to keep up with your brother or sister-in-law, trying to keep up with the next person in school, trying to be as pretty, trying to be as smart, trying to go to the right university, trying to have the right girlfriend or boyfriend, trying to have the right husband and right kids it's exhausting and you'll never measure up or you'll be too arrogant why don't we just forget about that and say God I want your will for my life and I want to bless those around me but it isn't about that imagine everybody if we become more that place we stop competing and we start completing and helping each other this is what it's all about don't worry about your life there's more to life than that so how do we seek first the kingdom I'm going to get really pragmatic here, everybody, because you know what? Let's just, again, this is not a list of things that you have to do, and if you don't do it, but make no mistake, there are still things you have to do. There's still a list of things you have to do. Have you noticed you have to eat or you don't live? Right? You have to eat, you have to drink. Have you guys noticed you have to sleep? Right? Uh, <clears throat> have you noticed you have to bathe? If you're sitting by yourself and no one's around you, you probably haven't found that out yet. Okay. First... Seek first the kingdom of God daily. Think about it. Every morning, most of us get up in the morning. What do we do? Normally, we wash our face, brush our teeth, take a shower, put on clothes. You guys don't come. You guys don't go to work with your pajamas on, though it's kind of hard to tell these days. But, you know, you change your clothes, right? You take at least 15, 20 minutes to get ready. And if you're a teenage girl, you take three hours to get ready. I don't know why I'd know that. But anyhow, I'm joking. I just hurt myself. Honey, I love you wherever you're at. But that's not what happens, right? How about if we spend this time just with the Lord instead? First time daily. I want to spend time with God first. Before I throw my clothes on, before I take that shower, listen, everybody, I understand. You're like, I can't take two hours. Don't worry. Start small. Start small. Say, God, I'm going to give God five. Just give, give, start with five minutes every day. You're better off five minutes every day than 15 minutes once a week. Just start, okay, before I get out of bed this morning, God, I give you this day. You know, one of the things that really hurt everybody, it's just a great blessing and a great curse, is these things. You know what this is, everybody? Yeah, it controls our life, right? <laughs> Think about it. I mean, everything we, I mean, everything we do is on this thing, and it's so easy to seek first what's on my iPhone or Android or Google, whatever it is. I, I got to see what's on here first. Oh, what's happened now? And, and there's been times, and listen, there's been times I've been hijacked by this thing. I'm looking at my email, and then something pops up. What happened here? Okay, I read a news story. That news story takes me to another news story, and then I hear about something else. And the next thing you know, oh, my gosh, 25 minutes went by. And what would happen if we say, you know what, I'm going to seek God first? No electronics until I, I like what Rob Malcolm said yet last week. He said, it's a good idea. good idea. Maybe we should try over 21 days. He says, guys, park your phone in another room than your bedroom. Park it in another room. Plug it in the kitchen, buy an alarm clock. That's what he said last week. I really appreciate it, Rob Malcolm saying that. And, and just, you know, that alone would be a big difference, wouldn't it, everybody? You might have, you're welcome to the light. What's going on? And you're kind of tired, and you start flipping your phone. The next thing you know, it's 2 o'clock in the morning. You're still looking at your phone. Has it happened to anybody? It's never happened to me. But I read my Bible on my phone. Okay, let's just move on. First time daily what you put first is the most important first matters order matters i want to give god the best part of my day not the worst part of my day that's what we want to be we want first we want to give him our first in our time every day right i'm giving god my time god this day belongs to you god i give you this day before i put my feet on the ground father i give you this day i ask you to help me with this day that i would bless you another thing important we have to find a place I mean, can you imagine if you said to yourself, uh, you, go, you going to work today? Yeah. What time do you go to work? Eh, whenever I get there. Where's your work located? I don't know. I, just, I just, just get in the car and I just drive there. I don't know where it is. I mean, think about it. If you go to school, there's a time and there's a place. Right? If something's important, you have to make a time and you make a place. And so, first time daily. First we have to do is give God a time. Find a time. Listen, if you don't make time, you won't have time. 
Yeah, but that's legalistic. No, it isn't, everybody. Is it legalistic to get dressed in the morning? Is it legalistic to have breakfast? No, you need to set a time. Set a time first. And then set a place. Set a place. It's good to have a place. Sometimes I have, a, sometimes I have to have a place here at the church because there's so much activity in the morning or there's an old couch we have in the basement that my wife wants to get, Cindy wants to get rid of. It's an old couch. It's, a ripped up, it's not a very nice couch, but I like the couch. The whole family likes it except for, my, except for Sandra. So you want to pray for her, you go right ahead. But that's the couch I like to sit on and have my cup of coffee. And I, I've had many occasions with the Lord or I like to come here to the office or go to a place in the woods. And I have certain places that I go and where I meet with God. And some of the sweetest times I've ever had in my life has been that daily time with God. And let me just say right now, I'll tell you, hands down, the greatest things that I've ever achieved in my life has happened because I spend time with God daily. Do I miss it sometimes? Yes, but I don't beat myself up. So first time, have time. Find a place. Find a place. Come on, let's, let's be real here, okay? If you're trying to date somebody, and you say, I want to take you on a date. Okay, when? I don't know, whenever. Where do you want to go? I don't know. Now, that married couples do that. Where do you want to go? I don't know. Where do you want to go? I don't know. But when you're dating, it's like, where do you want to oh, have a place figured out already? Have a restaurant, have the reservations ready, you have your clothes ready, you have a time, you have a place, right? But why is it with the most important relationship we have in our in our life, God? Eh, when I get around to it, I'll just do it. No, you have to find a time. Well, that's legalism. It's not legalism, it's called life. Okay, just you guys help me for I mean, there was a time, by the way, I did this. Uh, there was a time I made, a, I made a deal with God, which I said, hey, God, I'm not going to eat until I spend quality time with you. I lost 20 pounds. Fantastic. I should start a new diet and write a book and make a lot of money. You know, diet plan. But seriously, find a time and find a place and have a plan. Don't just whatever. And so I, I want to tell you right now, I, am, I, am I, is it the only way? I like to read through the Bible. I've been doing it for over 20 years now. I do it every year. Do I miss some days? Yes. And if I miss it, I go on to the following day because it will be there next year. But I'm telling you, as I read through the Bible, there's even a Facebook group I kind of try to start up that you guys can join. If you have any questions, uh, we're going through the Bible in a year. And if you can't do the Old Testament, then do the New Testament. Don't worry about it. Just, just start someplace. But I have found as I read the Word of God, it reads me. And it moves in me, and it, gives, it opens my eyes, and, and I begin to experience God. I begin to hear His voice. I tune my spirit to Him. It's the richest thing that I do every day, and, and as a result, I am, I'm who I am today because my daily time with God. Now, do I speak to God throughout the day? Yes, but that, un, that divided time, undivided time to God is so, so important. So first time daily. You need to set time or it will not happen, everybody. I'm telling you right now. You need to set a time. And here it is. A non-negotiable time. What are you doing? I'm sorry. I, I have an appointment. Just say you have an appointment. First in your relationships. Are you seeking God first in your relationships? Okay, we don't have time to break that down too much. How about first in the stewardship of money? Oh, pastor, I knew you were going to talk about money. Yes, I'm going to talk about money. You know why? Jesus talks about money more than anything else in the New Testament. Your riches. Because everything we have is a stewardship from him. We're not, about, we're not one of those churches, if you give $100,000, if you give $100, God will give you 1000 back. No, we're not about that. We give so we can bless. We don't give to get. We give to bless. And God's word is true, however. Listen, my grandparents did it. My parents have done it. I've done it all my life. I've always tithed. I give God the first, not the second, the first 10% God gets. Not this, I don't wait till I, have, uh, till I have seconds. So let me give you an example. I used to work at a restaurant in Norfolk, Virginia. It was called Cafe Something. I'm not going to tell you the name because you may not, not go there when you find out what kind of place it was. Delicious food. But the waiters and wait, waitresses used to come back with these expensive dishes, and they used, to, they used to pick off people's plates after people ate their meals. They'd take and they'd sop the bread in it. I'm like this, like the... Lobster bisque soup, they'd take bread in it after the person salivated all over it. They'd eat their steak and their shrimp. There'd be a half-eaten shrimp, and they'd finish the... It was disgusting. This is before the times of COVID. It was absolutely disgusting. Like, I, what's wrong with these people? But imagine, if you will, going to a restaurant, expensive restaurant. The violin music's playing. The lights are dim. You're sitting there. And the waiter or waitress comes out with a, with a plate of food. 
it's a beautiful steak. And you're saying, oh, this is fantastic. They put it on the tray before they put it there. They take your fork and knife, and they begin to cut it. And they start taking a couple, they start helping themselves with your plate. And then they take your drink, and they drink it. They go, here you go. And they give it to you. Are you going to eat that plate? What's on that plate? Are you going to leave a good tip? Well, how ridiculous is that, right? That's exactly what we do to God. Well, God, first, I'm going to have my part, and then you can have yours. How about this? As the founder of Hobby Lobby, the Greens say, God can do more with 90% than your 100%. And so, trusting God and saying, God, I'm, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to tithe. I'm going to give 10%, my first 10%, God. Listen, you don't have to tithe. You get to tithe. But the Bible says, bring the tithe into the storehouse. Test me. The only place in the Bible that says that. Now, why are you bringing this up for it? Because the church needs money? Listen, whether I'm the pastor or not, it's not about that. It's about your heart. And money is time. You spend your time to get money, so money represents your life. And so Jesus talks about it all the time. Trust God. There's a cornerstone guarantee. We'll do this. I, I dare you, if this is your home, tie for six months, 10%, first 10%. If it doesn't work, write the church. We'll write you a check in full for everything for six months and see if not you're more blessed. I'm just telling you, no one's ever tried us on that. If you want to try us, go ahead. I'm telling you, it works, everybody. It's supernatural. We don't serve a God. We don't, it's not about money. This is about where your heart is. And when I say, God, I'm trusting you. And remember, everybody, spend less than you make and, ten, and tithe and watch what God will do. Just, I'm telling you, it works. I've seen it all my life. So first in your relationships. First in the stewardship of, of money. And so... I believe this. This will be your best year ever if it's your best year spiritually. And the only way it can be your best year spiritually is by putting Jesus first. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added to you. Now, I want to encourage you. But one thing we do about stretching, we have to get ourselves ready. You see, there's no change without breaking. In order to, to see change in life, we have to break. Now, anyone have... I happen to have up here right now a $100 bill. Uh, does anyone have any change for it? You can keep this. Anyone have any change for a $100 bill? It's fake, by the way. <laughs> I didn't have $100 with me today, so I just, you know, I did something illegal, so don't call the FBI. <laughs> Looks pretty good, doesn't it? Anyhow, but no, but you seriously, you cannot get change for a $100 bill until you break it. And you can't get change in your life until something breaks. Something's got to break in your habits. Something's got to break in your time. And I want to encourage you. We're having these 21 days of fasting and prayer to make an opportunity to do that. The Bible says in Hosea 10, 12, sow for yourselves righteousness, reap in mercy, break up. You have to break up the fallow ground for it is time to seek the Lord till he comes and reigns righteousness on you. There are times and seasons where we have to break away from our normal pattern and say, I'm going to break away from a normal pattern. I'm going to take the next 21 days to fast and I'm going to pray. So, I don't know, what happened to the disciples? One time the disciples came to Jesus and said, Jesus, we couldn't cast this demon out. We don't know why. Why couldn't we cast this demon out? Then Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him here to me. O oh, faithless, faithless, you have, don't have enough faith, and a perverse generation. You're too, you're too connected to the world, and you don't have enough faith. So what do we want to do? We want to do several things. We want to begin to feed our spirit and disconnect from the world. However, this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. I'm telling you, sometimes it's very powerful to pray and fast. Well, how do you pray and fast? I'm going to take many of our time here today to do that, and we're going to have communion together as before we end. So just to kind of reiterate, what was the problem with the disciples? They had a lack of faith, and they were too connected to the world. They were faithless generation. And so God wants us to connect to him and connect to his ways. How do we overcome? The battle is won before the battle. Everything you've seen in Scripture, Jesus before he actually went and did the ministry for three and a half years. He spent 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness fasting 
and praying. Before Moses got the Ten Commandments, he was fasting and praying. Before Elijah was given a new information, he fasted and he prayed. Before the disciples went out, they prayed and they fasted and God gave them direction. I'm telling you, there's something about that. When you deny yourself, you connect closer to God. This is what we all want to do. Prayer and fasting is the great work before the great work happens. And so I want to encourage you that today begins 21 days of fasting and prayer. And so it starts uh, January 9th to 29th. We have prayer services Monday through Friday from 6.30 a.m. to 7.30 a.m. right here and online. You can join us when you're getting ready. We want to encourage you as we pray about the new year. We're going to be talking about making new patterns. This, this coming week, we're going to talk about patterns, uh, uh, patterns of prayer and how to help you guys take it to the next level. Each day we'll be a teaching on that and a time of prayer. That will be happening. All service will be on cornerstonecheshire.com and also on Facebook and I think YouTube as well. Three or four places will be. Uh, on our website, uh, cornerstonecheshire.com, on Facebook, on YouTube. Yeah, those are the three places we'll be. So you're welcome to join us with that, okay? So what is fasting and prayer? First of all, what it's not, okay? What it's not is this. It is not a hunger strike to get God's attention. We're not in prison burning our mattresses and not eating to get God to work on our behalf. What it's all about is getting ourselves to move, not God to move. Fasting without prayer equals a diet. Let's be honest. A lot of us can go on a diet. Thank you for all those plates of cookies, by the way. I can barely get into my sweater this morning. Okay. And we also do it, don't do it to impress others either. Okay. We don't fast to get God to move. Instead, we fast to get ourselves moving. It's not about that. It's not about showing off, everybody. It's about disciplining ourselves. Now, how do we fast and what can we do to fast? Okay. Let's get into that right now. Okay, there are types of fasting we can do. A total fast, which is just water. And if you're going to do something like that, I'm going to have a glass of water, by the way. If you're just going to have water only for 21 days, whatever it is, you need to talk to your doctor first and make sure it's okay for you to do that. Okay, if you want to do something like that. Again, it's fasting in prayer. Why do we do it? Because you pray, you eat at least three times a day. And so it's a reminder, instead of eating I'm going to take that time to pray, read my Bible, or spend time in worship. How about a partial fast? Maybe you fast lunch, or maybe you fast dinner, or, or maybe you fast, I don't know, different things like that. Here's another one we can do. A Daniel fast, which is 21 days, fruits and vegetables only. No sweets, no meats. Again, that's what Daniel did. It's a good way to purge. And by the way, I did that, and my blood count was phenomenal. If you want to get life insurance, do that for 21 days, then get your blood test, and you'll get good rates. <laughs> How would I know that? Don't ask me. Okay, so we can do that. <laughs> Here's another one. I think, you know what? This is becoming even more dramatic than the food. It's a soul fast. How about we fast uh, Netflix? How about we fast Facebook? How about we fast Instagram? How about we fast all this media we're looking at all the time? Listen, everybody, I don't think we recognize, oh, I, I, I don't have to do that, really. I'm telling you, and so I want to encourage you. How about this? How about we just do what I mentioned earlier? How about we put our phones not next to our bed at least for 21 days? Just that alone. I'm going to do that tonight. Okay, honey? We're going to do what we said. Okay. Even though I have to do correspondence. And, okay. <laughs> There's always an excuse. How about so fast? How about we get away from our phones? Think about it, everybody. Now, if you have to do social media, maybe you set it up 20 minutes or 30 minutes a day to do, like for your company, your business, you have to interact. Okay, do that. And then put a limit on it. You can put limits on it, by the way. On, on the Apple device, you can put limits. And how about we limit this? How about we just do, how about we get away from all this other entertainment that we're doing and spend time with God instead? And I'm just saying, I, I think, by the way, I think if we would do this alone, a revival would happen in our country, among the church. Think about it. We're, I mean, we're so dependent on these things. Listen, I mean, I, make no mistake about it. It's some great things about the phone. But when the phone distracts you from everything that's important, I mean, it's happened to, how long does it take to get off track with this thing? Well, you guys are awfully quiet. Either you're convicted or you think I'm a complete sinner. I think the first one is the right one. Okay, so I just want to encourage you with that today, that we're going to do a soul fast. And so I encourage you to do that. Take the next 21 days, everybody, all right? I know this is very practical. Let me go back to what we talked about. The most important thing that you and I can do is put Christ first in everything. It's a promise that God has given us. It's not, a, it's not just a good idea. It actually works. See, the one thing, the one thing habit is this. Seek first the kingdom of God 
and his righteousness. And all these things will be added to you. Therefore, don't worry about tomorrow. Sufficient is this day's trouble. Let's make the one thing first, Jesus, and watch what God will do in this year. This will be your best year spiritually. If you make it, it'll be your best year, if it's your best year spiritually, it'll be your best year. Why not give God the best, amen? Let's pray. Father, I thank you for today, Lord. I know it's, a, it's almost like a halftime talk before we go into the field or, or a pregame talk. And Lord, I recognize that this is nothing probably groundbreaking. Yet, God, you have not made it complicated. You made it abundantly simple for us. Father, I pray this would be our best year. I pray that we would stretch to the higher things in you in 22, God. That we would stretch to the higher things in you in 22. God, I ask that you would, Lord, that we would come back a year from now in 2023, Lord willing, and we would be able to say, I had my best year I ever had. I grew so much spiritually. Father, I'm asking that you would bring clarity, that you'd bring grace, Father, that we would make sure that we spend time with you first. In Jesus' name. And Lord, we pray for an amazing new year. Amen. You know, I want to encourage you with something. Without accountability, we don't really, can you maybe find somebody? Would you keep me accountable? I really want to go after this year. I really want to give God, maybe for the 21 days, find someone to be accountable to. And, and maybe tell someone, what are you going to be doing? And, and again, we don't do it to compare and to say, I'm better than you. We do it to help each other out. Hey, before we um, break into communion, if you don't have communion uh, elements, go ahead and raise your hand. We'll have someone stop by to do that. Something we do every single week we're here is the most important relationship you can ever have is a relationship with God. And the only way you can have a relationship with God is through Jesus Christ. And Jesus died on the cross for you and I. Because without him, we, can't, we had no chance at all. No matter how good you try to be, you're never going to be good enough. And the good news is this, everybody. Jesus is the way. You don't have to strive. You don't have to try to earn God's favor. All God's looking for is you and I to say, God, I surrender to you. Have you surrendered your life to Jesus? Maybe you did in the past and you've walked away. Maybe you've never completely surrendered. There's always a caveat. I, I can't yet. Today is the day. Today is the day of salvation for those watching online as well. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes just for a moment. I'm going to pray a prayer of commitment. And if you connect your heart to that prayer, God hears that prayer from you. How many of you would be honest enough to say, you know, I used to walk with God and I've walked away. Or I've never completely given my life to Jesus, but today I want to. Nice and high. Can I see your hands real quick? Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Let's pray right now. Lord Jesus, I thank you for dying on the cross for me. I believe you're the Son of God. I believe you rose again from the dead. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. I receive forgiveness of my sins. I ask you to forgive me of everything I've, both, I've done, both known and unknown. Today, I declare this life is not my own. I give my life to you today. Lord, take my life. It is yours. Thank you, based upon what you did on the cross for me and raising from the dead and myself, giving my life to you. I thank you. I am now your child, and I am born again in Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, we believe you became born again, or you got in the right path again if you've walked off. In the front pocket of your seat, or if you're sitting in the front in the back pocket behind you, you can pull one of these cards out, or you can go online, get your cell phones, the things I've been criticizing all day, <laughs> and you can text uh, to 860-4999-499-84, let me say this right, 860-499-4888. That's 860-499-4888. And text BELIEVE. We want to help you with the next steps. Okay, everybody? Amen. Hey, before we leave for today, we want to give you an opportunity. You don't have to give. You get to give. There are four different ways you can give. There's boxes in the back of the room. If you're online, there's four different ways you can give as well. You can text to give at 
0-8 at Cornerstone Cheshire. You can get our Push Pay app, which is how I give. It's very easy. It's wonderful to use it that way. Also, you can go to uh, cornerstonecheshire.com or their boxes in the back. Okay, so Father, I pray you bless this offering, Father. I thank you that you will multiply it and you will, uh, thank you, you will meet all of our needs according to your riches and glory in Jesus' name. Hey, before I give the benediction, I just want to mention our growth track is not for today, but we'll have it again next week. Next week will be step three. Uh, step two was not be able to do it today. Okay, everybody, we also have a prayer. People that will pray for you in the front if, if anyone wants prayer. Also in the front desk, if you've given your life to Christ, we want to help you with our next steps. So may the Lord bless you, may he keep you, may he shine his face upon you, and let's put Christ first and watch what he'll do in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. God bless you guys.